Hello there, I'm Helen Iveson and I work in communications here at Kellett. Thank you for joining us for Talking Heads, the first in a series of uh, sessions where we look and discuss major issues in education. Now today I'm joined by Mark Stacey, who's our assistant head at the senior school here. Now he joined us from the International School of Brussels and prior to that was at Cheltenham's Ladies College. Now, I believe that your speciality is helping to prepare students for university entrance, particularly for highly selective universities around the world. He's also a politics and history teacher and teaches many Oxbridge classes. So please feel free to pose any questions you might have for Mark in the comments, and we'll get back to you at the end of the session. But of course, be aware that we can't comment on individual cases. So Mark, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. So today I thought it might be helpful if first of all we define what we mean by highly selective universities. Okay, so there's a variety of definitions that we could use, but, but here at Kellett we use a, a broad definition where it is universities which have an admissions intake of about 15% of the number of applicants that apply. Oxford and Cambridge is slightly higher than that, but for the US that's the, uh, the definition that we use. Okay, how about in Hong Kong? In Hong Kong, the situation there is that I wouldn't usually uh, to manage that process because I've just come here for Brussels. We have other expertise in that area. Okay, great. So just how competitive are these universities to get into? Uh, so if we take the UK first of all, if we look at Oxford and Cambridge, you're looking at roughly around um, 21,000 applications per year for about 3,000 places in terms of Oxford, Cambridge is, is quite similar. So that produces a, a, a rate of something in the region of 15 to 20% every year, but it varies from course to course. And that's a, a very important point that we, we need to stress and we stress to our students quite heavily. If you look at a course like Economics and Management at uh, Oxford, we're looking at 5.9% or thereabouts of the, um, the applications result in a offer and then the student makes that offer. It can be dramatically different. So something like Earth Sciences has a 35% acceptance rate. So for students who are particularly strong in a variety of areas and aren't sure what they want to do but do want to go to Oxford or Cambridge, then a choice of course can be a really, really important factor. Okay, interesting. So how do parents work out if this is the right path for their child? So in terms of, of the UK and Oxford and Cambridge, you've got to be looking at a student that really, really wants to be pushed and stretched. The, um, the, the process of, uh, of applying, as, as many people will know, is that you go through the UCAS form first of all, and then that gets sent off. And then for most of the courses um, at both of the universities, you will be looking at some form of testing. That testing will produce a result and then they'll invite people to come to interview. Now the interview is, is the key area as far as we're concerned because it's the interview that reflects the style of teaching that they're going to receive. So that interview will usually be two, maybe three academics with an individual student and they will be pressing that student on areas of expertise that that student has. If your child likes to learn in that way, likes to be pushed and stretched and challenged on their opinions, then those two universities are excellent places to study. If, however, they preserve to absorb information, they don't want to be in a, in a kind of intellectually confrontational environment, then even if they get through the interview, it is going to be three miserable years. And, and very few people that have been there sail casually through this process. It can be quite a, a stressful experience to be put on the spot by world-leading experts on a weekly basis. But if, if your child responds in that way, if you as a student respond really, really well to that, then Oxford or Cambridge could be the place for you. As, as a rough guide, when we have students coming back from interviews and they say that they really enjoyed the interview, that indicates that, that it's going to be the right kind of place for them. Okay, so not for everyone. And those interviews are also on Zoom at the moment? Yes, so last year they were on Zoom and the, the option is, has been there in the past for, uh, for people to be interviewed on Zoom. Lots of students will want to go there as well for the experience and that's, that's a valuable thing because it is a very different environment to here, obviously. Okay, so staying with the UK for a while, do you need British qualifications to get into a British university? Not typically. I mean, the, the leading universities are um, very au fait with a, a variety of qualifications from around the world, and they have networks of expertise. So if it was a, a particularly unusual application from an area where they didn't have the expertise, usually they'd be able to reach out to colleagues at other universities who may have more expertise in Nigerian qualifications, Turkish qualifications, things like that. As a rough rule of thumb, though, 
any uh, student who's taken IB courses, any student who's taken A levels, any student who's taken AP courses, all three of those qualifications will be very, very well understood by British universities. There is an argument that A level could be slightly favoured because it favours depth. Um, and obviously, if you're applying to most university courses in the UK, you're looking to look to do engineering. And so the ability to have studied maths in depth, physics in depth, and chemistry in depth is probably more valuable than the, the wider spread that you might get on an IB course or by taking multiple APs. Okay, what about what's the situation for American universities? Would they also recognize? So, American universities will have, um, so the larger American universities or the, or the more renowned ones will have a very, very experienced team, as it is in the UK, with a good understanding of all of the multiple combinations. They do like A levels, they, they um, think very highly of them, they think very highly of the, the depth that it involves. They would never hold it against a student if they hadn't got IB or AP. If they go to a school that offers GCSE and A-level, then you're, um, you're assessed in the context of those particular subjects. What they like to see is that you have challenged yourself, so you've taken as demanding a, a course load as you possibly can and looked to do things around that to kind of augment your portfolio, to augment your... Um, what you have to offer to that university. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you next, actually. So what are these universities looking for aside from great grades? So if we do, should we do UK first or US sure. first? let's do the UK. Okay, so for Oxford and Cambridge, what they are looking for is a student that is in love with their subject, and, and, and that's probably the, the best way that I can explain it. Your standard admissions offer will be somewhere in the region of two A stars and an A, or A star two A. So the, um, the academic achievement at A level, um, or at IB, is, um, is kind of taken for granted. But some schools, some students are very, very good at learning for exams. They're very good at picking up exam technique. They're very good at delivering under that kind of stressful environment. But it's not enough to know your course inside ACT. There's got to be a, a genuine, overwhelming passion for what you do, and that's got to have been manifested in going beyond the syllabus as far as you possibly can. A history student who applies and then says, I love studying the Nazis, is not going to get in because everybody enjoys studying the Nazis. It's fascinating, and everybody has, has done it for the most part in GCSE and, and lots of the A-levels and the IB programme. A student that has demonstrated that they love history by going on and reading more deeply in areas that they haven't looked at before during the school curriculum, that's a student that's attractive. A student that is so obsessed that they read historical fiction to get a different perspective on it. A student that's so obsessed that they're going on to read books about the practice of doing history. So the default would be an E.H. Carr book of what is history, but looking at kind of Margaret Macmillan, looking at people who talk about different theories of history to understand the difference between a liberal viewpoint or Whiggish history or Marxist history, that's the kind of person that is already setting them up for themselves up for, for huge success when it comes to Oxford and Cambridge because you are engaging, you're being interviewed by a leading expert and that expert wants to know that you are as passionate about that subject as they are. And how do they demonstrate that before the interview? Does that all go in their personal statement? So the personal statement would obviously include a, a huge amount about that, and then the reference from the school would probably make reference to the fact that this student has been reading beyond the curriculum or has taken part in Model United Nations or taken part in debating competitions and things like that. The teacher's input in terms of the reference that the school writes um, will usually include information from the classroom teacher who will refer to the fact that the student stays behind to discuss different theories, has taken part in different competitions that require producing essays. So all of that will be in place. But then when it comes to the, the tests, the tests that I mentioned earlier for history, again, if we stick with that, the, the HAT, the History Aptitude Test, will include questions on areas of history that the student hasn't ever seen before. So for example, it will be a source and extract from an Icelandic saga. They've got no real way of predicting that the Icelandic sagas are going to come up. But then the questions will say, OK, what can we find out about Icelandic society from this particular extract? And that's not demanding that they know Icelandic sagas. That's demanding that they know how to interpret a historical source and infer information from that. And that's something that you can achieve 
more easily the more you've read and the more interested you are in the subject as a whole. Okay, great. So that's British universities. What about American universities? What are they looking okay. for? So American universities are a totally different kettle of fish. Um, you don't apply to a course at American University. You're applying to the university because for the most part they will offer um, a liberal arts education which will require you to take a variety of different subjects. They vary from university to university. Some universities are more prescriptive than others. So Columbia, for example, will say you must take all of these courses in your first year and then you can add other things on around the outside. Somewhere like Brown will give you totally free reign for the first couple of years to do whatever you like. Eventually you settle on a major and that becomes what you graduate with in the end. So because they're not looking for specific expertise in a specific area, they can afford to look at a student in a much more holistic fashion. So that means looking at that student in terms of their academics. They need the students to be strongly academic, so that's good exam results, um, good references from the school about their academic work, and up until last year, strong SAT or ACT results. We've seen because of COVID that some schools in America have dropped their SAT or ACT requirements. It may well come back. If you think you're going to do well, it, it's not a bad idea to take those particular uh, tests. That takes care of the academics, but it's a holistic admissions process. So then they're looking for the kind of person that you are and whether you are going to fit into that grouping. There'll be four-year courses in America as opposed to three-year courses. There is an expectation that the group of students, the class of 2025, 2026, is going to come together as a group of students. MIT has a very good analogy for it where they say, we're looking for a group of students to climb a mountain, not for the best individual climbers. Um, and so they're trying to put together a team that will have certain areas of expertise and inspire each other and support each other. So they're looking for contributions to the life of the community that you're in. So that's the school or the town or the city or the county. Then they're looking for areas of expertise. So that could be sporting expertise. You're a particularly outstanding field hockey goalkeeper. You're a particularly outstanding lacrosse player, swimmer, uh, yachtswoman. Then, potentially, not all of these things, but any of these, then contributions that you've made to um, political parties. So in the case of the UK, you might be leader of the, the kind of the young conservatives, and that is attractive because you've put yourself forward, you have challenged yourself, you've risen to a position of, of leadership. So leadership can be very important. You've started a club or society, you're entrepreneurial, you've started a business of some description. If you want to be an engineer, you've taken an old uh, motorbike apart and put it back together again. All of those things suggest a student that is proactive, a student that is engaged, a student that's going to contribute something. The final criteria for America is, is the one that's often the most nebulous and the most difficult to understand. That is the institutional priorities. It's obvious when it comes to sports. So if you look at um, admissions into American universities that are sports related then you might have a, a senior team at Harvard, senior girls lacrosse team and one of their players um, is leaving Harvard at the end of that year. So they're looking to replace that player unless right. they've got someone good coming through. So their coaches are actively looking to recruit somebody who is academically capable and plays that position to a high standard. Would that ever happen in the UK? No. No, so, so sport wouldn't be that important. But even down to other institutional priorities like the person who coordinates the yearbook is a senior and they're leaving, so somebody with the yearbook experience would be valuable. Even down to the fact that the university may have a professor of Russian but no Russian majors coming through. And that professor of Russian is looking like having a very, very light schedule and getting paid for it. So they may be tasked to recruit students with a particular interest in majoring in Russian. That doesn't mean to say the student has to stay like that, but they stand a better chance of filling all of their class spaces if they are bringing in people who are expressing an interest in that area. It doesn't work for things like economics or international relations because they're never going to be short of that. But some of the more niche courses, if you are expressing an interest in uh, majoring in that particular area, that might make you more appealing than a student looking to do engineering or politics. Okay, great. Well, that's from the student side, what they do. What does Kellett do to help these students? Um, so, should we go UK? You ask. You choose. All right. Um, well, we'll do a kind of a general thing first, and then we'll talk about um, UK specifically and then US specifically. So, I think what is provided at, at Kellett in terms of what I've seen from my own perspective and what I've seen from um, the perspective of, of my two children who are both here is a challenging academic environment. There are students 
interested, engaged, pushing each other, and, and it creates a critical mass of interested students in the classroom, which as a, as a teacher is, is wonderful. You have students who are wanting to stay behind, wanting to find out more, wanting to take part in competitions, and, and that pushes everybody on collectively. I think we have a very high standard of teaching, but that's what should be expected. But then beyond that, I think what we have to do is to cultivate as far as possible an attitude of engagement with learning right from the time students arrive in, in Kellett, whether that be in the prep schools or here in the senior school. So my experience is, is connected to the senior school. Um, so what we're seeing is that we're trying to give them access to interesting information that might be something that they take forward themselves. So around the screens that you'll see in the school, we have a hundred great pieces of art with explanations about why they're particularly great pieces of art. I'm not saying that every student stops by and is, is waiting for the latest information on Mark Rothko, but it's there for them to engage them. Then we'll have maps that are interesting, infographics that are interesting, things like that. We also have a website that, that I look after that has a, a kind of a daily feature on it that will have a, a video that is of interest to students. And then we share that and then it gets passed around because the students spend an awful lot of time on YouTube because they're young people. But nobody is really curating stuff that is interesting or inspiring for them amongst their friendship groups. It's lots and lots of cat videos and explanations of how to build things in Minecraft. Whereas if you can inject something that is inspiring and relates to the American presidential race or relates to Black Lives Matter, that can be something that, that engages them in the right kind of way. So that's a kind of a, a general overview of what's happening. Specifically then, when we get into the sixth form, we are looking at students with GCSE results and if their GCSE results are in the region of seven, eight A stars or equivalent, so eight and nines in terms of, of GCSE, then they're potential Oxbridge candidates. Cambridge usually say that statistically students with seven A stars and above are the ones that tend to do best. And so that, that, that makes a, a decent benchmark for, for whether students should be um, interested or, or um, whether the stats are on their side. Those students we identify and we can talk to them about, um, about whether they're interested. Some aren't, some are, some are interested in going to America, so we'll, we'll part those for the moment and then come back to them. Um, you can self-identify, of course, if a student has a particular passion in one area. So we have coming through kind of a number of brilliant linguists who maybe scientifically and mathematically aren't as strong. They might not do love the same GCSEs, but they're a potential linguist for, uh, for Oxford or Cambridge. So we can identify those students early on, and we also reach out to the parents with something that's called a brag sheet. So brag. A brag sheet. Right. It's a very American uh, thing that we used to use in my, uh, my previous school, but it's very, very effective because sometimes students aren't aware of their relative strengths and weaknesses. And so if you ask them what they're good at, they'll, they'll vacillate and be kind of self-denigrating. So a brag sheet gives the parents parents a chance to say, right, this is what I'm proud of my child for, this is what I've seen them do that's really impressed me. This is the conversations that we've had about universities, these are my aspirations for them and this is their aspirations. So that can sometimes reveal particular aspects of that student that, that might be useful for us to work with. So we gather all that information together and then we kind of identify and the students say, yes, I, I, I want to go to Oxford or Cambridge. At that point, we start a process with weekly meetings that will usually be with me um, in the first instance with a wider group of, um, of Oxbridge candidates where we will try and look at different materials from the different perspectives of subjects that um, they're going to be going um, to apply for. So we started last year by looking at the sewage system in London. We had a group of students that were mathematicians, physicists, potential engineers, uh, human sciences students, law students, historians, and it gave a really, really good opportunity for those students to engage with the topic from different perspectives. So what that meant was that the engineers could look at it from the challenge of building a sewage system. The mathematicians could look at it from the statistical calculations that had to be done. The historians could look at it from the position it placed in the development and the growth of London. The lawyers could look at it from different perspectives. So we're trying to introduce a way of looking at concepts that they haven't come across in their lessons before. Mm -hmm. And that gives them the opportunity to stretch and challenge them. So we'll do that for four or five weeks to get them used to the idea of discourse, challenging each other, learning from each other and developing perspectives. Then we'll start to break them down into, into groups of kind of three humanities students, three engineers and mathematicians. 
and then be meeting with those groups on a weekly basis as well. In those sessions, we might look at the testing requirements, so practice for the, the TSA, the Thinking Skills Assessment for, uh, for PPE, um, for geography as well, um, and how to do those kind of questions. We might look at a preparation for the maths or the past, the maths aptitude test or the physics aptitude test. Once we're into that process, then we're getting closer to them actually applying, and then they're finding out about invitations to interviews. Once they're invited to interview, then we're starting to do one-on-one -on -one mock interviews, and those will sometimes be with me, or with me and a subject expert, so a mathematician, or a scientist, or a linguist. Um, and then as we get closer and closer to the date, then we'll start having mock interviews with people that they don't know. So this is hugely valuable, speaking to teachers at other schools who will interview them as if it isn't at Oxford or Cambridge. Interview. Why is that so valuable? Because no matter how good you are at asking questions and how mean a persona that you adopt or how different the persona that you adopt, you are still a teacher that they know and they've worked with before. Right. And lots of the, the problems that students face when they go into an interview is it, it's one of the first times that they've really engaged with a, an educated adult asking them difficult questions and, and you've only got 20, 25 minutes in that interview and if you spend the first 15 minutes being flustered because you've never been in that situation before that makes it um, really really challenging for you so I have a, a network of people the school has a network of people um, former students that went to these universities and went through the process teachers that have worked in this area for a long time so that gives them experience and, and our students this time around had at least three of those, sometimes four. What we're aiming to do uh, with this next cohort is have a, an Oxford interview night where we'll invite other schools to come in to send their potential applicants and also to send their teachers and so that would enable our students to be interviewed by teachers from other schools and other schools students to be interviewed by our teachers so they're getting that experience of an educated adult asking them questions but in an environment that's, that's a bit more reasonable. So there's a couple of schools that I've already spoken to about that who are very willing to kind of swap over and, and, and that's the process. So we're, we're taking them up to the interview and then from that point on we have done in terms of, of our department in the system all we can. The offer then comes through and then it's down to the students and the teachers to deliver on the offer. Okay. Sounds so that's good. America. Oh, oh, no, that's not no, America. That's the UK. <laughs> America wise, um, we would want to start engaging with those students earlier because what we want from our American um, applicants is for them to, to be able to demonstrate commitment to their extracurricular activities, to their community over a more protracted amount of time. Nothing is more obvious to an American admissions officer than somebody who has started a new club in March of the year that they're going to be applying to university in. And it, it just screams desperate, let's try and harvest some, um, some extracurriculars. So uh, this year, for example, I was speaking to our uh, fifth form students, so that's year 13, 12, 11, midway through the year to, to see the expression of interest. And then once I've started to speak to them, then we start to look at what are they currently doing in terms of extracurriculars that we can build on. Mm -hmm. So in the past, this has been things like a, a student that was particularly interested in biology and chemistry. He was on for very, very good grades, but then this was in Belgium, so we suggested that he starts brewing his own beer. Now, <laughs> that works for a, a, a number of reasons. It, it's a demonstration or an extrapolation of his existing interests. It's the kind of thing that a missions officer would read and then out, go, right. <laughs> that's interesting. And it fitted in with a, a Belgian stereotype as well, and it, and it enabled us to do some interesting things. So once he's brewed some beer, then we can brand it with the school's label and then sell it at school events. So okay. it, things like that start to build up um, a portfolio for a student that makes them stand out. So for example, um, here at Kellett, I'm, I'm working with one student who's a, a really interesting artist. And we're quite lucky in having a huge atrium when you come into the school with big glass windows. So we're looking at, at doing an art installation in that atrium that is a good 30 foot by 20 foot or okay. putting um, effectively gel screens up in terms of uh, the glass windows to create our own stained glass window. Now that, that's not something that other students will be able to offer. Mm. And that will speak to a university about creativity, about proactivity and all of those different things. But there's a much longer lead time for America to get things like that going mm. takes longer. So we really need the engagement from um, fifth form onwards. 
we also have to be looking at planning the testing program for SATs and ACTs, so we're, we're hoping to introduce a, uh, having a testing company come in here to kill it. I've worked with a company in the past to guarantee a 100 point increase in the SAT score or your money back, provided the student goes through the program correctly, so that has to be built into the American applicants process, um, and then it takes much longer for the American uh, applicants to be able to fill out all of their application materials because there's an initial essay for the common application, then you might be looking at supplementary essays. For some universities, they might ask for, for up to 10 extra essays on top of mm -hmm. the original one. So a very different situation to the UK where you just write your personal statement and then it's done. Okay, uh, but considering you know the last year and the year that we're having, there hasn't been as many opportunities for students to do ECAs and the kind of things that you're talking about. How, is, how will that affect offers, do you think? Um, well, everybody's in the same boat, so mm. all of the admissions officers will be we're dealing with those kinds of things. ECA-wise, it, it's less of a concern for Oxford and Cambridge, because unless it's directly connected to your subject, it, it doesn't really affect your application as much. If you're applying to do PPE, for example, and you've been part of Model UN, that makes sense. If you're applying to do PPE and you've taken the lead in the school play, that's less significant. If we're looking at ECAs not having taken place for lots and lots of students across the world, then the universities will be looking at, well, what have you done? That, that's not sufficient excuse not to have done anything at all. In fact, if anything, it's a demonstration of flexibility and, and, um, and how you kind of think around a problem. So in my previous school, we were in this situation with a student that was applying and we decided that um, he was very into to gaming and we were going to run an, an online gaming team. And so that was going to be linked up with the school sports. Um, and then we would start to play matches against um, other schools elsewhere. And then that's something that people can log in, they can watch through things like Twitch. Um, but he's generating a sense of community. He's being proactive. He's making something happen, even with COVID happening in the background. So there's, there's lots of possibilities of things that you can do despite the limitations. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, the, the limitations emphasize your creativity in, in mm -hmm. managing to achieve anything. And demonstrating your resilience. Okay. Yes, yeah, resilience, all of those things. Okay, great. So that's what the school does. What can parents do to support their children? Uh, so parents play an absolutely vital role in this process. Um, it's sometimes very, very straightforward when you meet parents for the first time to understand why a child is engaged and enthusiastic and contributes and has a huge hinterland of knowledge because the parents are very much engaged in discussion with the child. I think, I think that's the key thing. Conversations are complex and appropriate for young adults to be having with parents. So they're talking about what's happening in the news. They're talking about what they're doing at work if they're an architect or an engineer or a doctor and explaining these things. That serves two purposes. It increases the child's understanding of, of, of what's going on and of the parent's role, but it also gets them used to talking about complex issues with another adult. So as much as possible, it's, it's the quality of dinner table conversations. Um, if you're having friends over for dinner and those friends are, do interesting jobs, then have your child there and, and have that child engage with somebody else about their opinions. So that's vitally important. Getting your child to explain things to you as well is very, very useful because it helps their learning. When you have to teach something, you have to think about it in a different way, in a deeper and a more involved way. And articulating an explanation is a key skill when it comes to being interviewed for Oxford and Cambridge because you are going to be given problems by the, the tutors in that interview and you're going to have to explain your thinking. You take a huge risk in an Oxford and Cambridge interview if you are given a problem and you work on it silently and then present the answer. Because they're not looking for the answer, they're looking for how you think your way through that. And explaining things to your parents is a really, really useful way of doing that. And the, the more kind of um, foolish the questions that the parents can ask, the more it appeals to the student to tend to, um, to, tend to correct them and, and then explain things more clearly. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is don't get drawn in by the promise of an exciting $3,000 two weeks at Stanford University summer course. 
that serves no real purpose. All it demonstrates is that you can afford to pay for a summer course at Stanford. Okay. It is far, far, far better to spend your summer doing something that is proactive and engaged. So you could go and do a course at MIT which purports to teach you all sorts of things about design and engineering. It's far better to go and do some work experience in a small local garage in, uh, in the middle of Central. Well, probably not. Don't get garages in Central. Maybe not. Counting. Right. <laughs> Counting. Um, where you learn some Cantonese and after four weeks there you can fix a taxi and have it back on the road in about an hour and a half. That is an engineer. The child that does the course at MIT is a child whose parents can afford to pay for a course at MIT. Okay. That kind of degree of proactivity is, is really, really helpful. Parents so desperately want to do the best and sometimes they will look at, at, at events and look at activities and then think, that's got a brilliant name and it costs a lot of money, ergo it must be superb. But I absolutely guarantee. Save your money. Save your money. Send your child out to do something difficult and engage where they have to be proactive. Okay, great. And just a reminder to anyone watching, you can put questions in the comments if you've got anything you want to ask Mark. Okay, so next question. What, so how easy do you think it is for students who may not have been to the country that they get offered a place in to transition? Um, a lot of that will depend on the research that the student has done. A lot of it will depend on the, the institutional relationship with that university. So at Kellett, there's a number of universities that our students go to very, very frequently. So aside from, from Oxford and Cambridge, we're looking at UCL, we're looking at Durham, Exeter, Bristol. So there's an established path through, which means that there are alumni there that the student can reach out to in order to, to understand what are the pros, what are the cons, what do I need to know before I arrive. That's always very useful. Often these are friends or friends of friends and with the, the kind of connectivity that social media provides it's very easy to get in touch with people. So that's a significant help. I think also going on to um, websites like uh, Reddit's um, website of uh, SickForm um, subreddit on there has got lots and lots of people who are talking about where they're applying to and they're talking about their successes so you can you can meet people online who will be going to your university doing your course okay. and therefore you can connect with them earlier in the process which, which always helps kind of arriving in a new place where you don't know anyone but you've chatted to some people online can be really really good for um, for America College Confidential there's other subreddits and, and things like that um, Google Maps and kind of navigating your way around the university before you arrive there can be very, very useful. The student websites and the, the incoming student websites can be great. The Americans are magnificent at connecting incoming students up with existing students. Mm. So there will be alumni networks in Hong Kong for all of the major universities. In fact, we, we have relationships with kind of Princeton alumni network and with Harvard's alumni network. Um, so they're good. So you can, you can meet people who have graduated from there who can give you help and advice about what to do when you arrive. The, the key things in terms of what students should be doing is I think they need to learn to tidy up after themselves to cope with that help. That's vitally important. Um, they, yeah, we all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they need to learn to cook two or three simple things. Um, if you can cook something brilliant and complicated, you will never be short of friends, particularly at a British university, um, because that kind of first weekend, even in the Hall of Residence where you're left to your own devices, if someone kind of swoops in and then says, right, I'm going to lay on a full um, Hong Kong-style Chinese banquet, then you will be good for friends forever. Um, and budgeting as well, I think, is useful because that's something that is easy to forget about when you're here, but for, for many families, the, the cost of sending a child to university means that money is not going to be as freely available as it, as it may have been in, uh, in Hong Kong and other environments. So the, the budgeting and the looking after yourself are, are key, and then it's about building your network in that city and, and finding out from people what it's like. What I've found in Hong Kong so far with, with Kellet students is that they're often very, very well connected to the UK. They've been there, they've seen lots of cities before. Sometimes they haven't been to the smaller places, so places like St Andrews can come as a shock because it is cold and it is rainy and there are only three streets and there's a lot of good pubs. But after You're Hong Kong, from experience. Yes. That's, that was a tour that we would take on by the University of St Andrews to stress the quality of the pubs <laughs> in the area. Um, 
but that can be a surprise. But that's part of the advising process before we even get to the application. You've got to be able to talk honestly with your your counsellor, if you're in a school that has a counsellor, with kind of people in the sick form team, and then say, I'm interested in St Andrews, but I've never lived in a city that's less than 7 million people. Um, in terms of population, I've never lived below the 20th floor of an apartment complex. Well, wonderful though St Andrews is, it might not be the place for you. You might find London, Birmingham, Manchester to be more suitable. So some of those conversations that are taking place in advance are vitally important. With the US, there are a whole other range of possibilities. So we're talking differences in demographics, differences in weather. If you're in Chicago, it's an incredible city, but bitingly cold sometimes. Um, likewise, if you're in the Deep South, in wonderful universities that you might get in uh, in uh, Mississippi or even in some Tennessee, somewhere like Vanderbilt. That's a very different world to maybe the, the cities that our students have been to before, the, the New Yorks and Los Angeles and, uh, and to Miami and places like that. So really doing your research properly when it comes to the US is, is much, much more important, I would say, than doing it in the UK where the institutional knowledge and um, and the relationship that, uh, that Hong Kong has with the UK makes it a bit easier for students to understand what it's like. Okay, great. So the final question from me is what about scholarships? Am I right in thinking America offers more? Yeah. Um, so in terms of scholarships, um, the UK offers very few. There are some out there, but usually they're, they're less than generous. Um, I had a, a student who's at Oxford now um, who is studying maths. He was um, the, the top maths student in his particular year group and he sent me an email saying how excited he was about it and, and sent me the letter. And the letter said that they were awarding him a £300 scholarship for the following year, um, which is cripplingly ungenerous. But it did say that they also were allowing him to stay in university accommodation over the course of the summer, which is quite a nice deal. Um, the big money is in the US. So some of the um, some of the universities have bequests that are the size of, of small nations' GDPs, a huge amount of money, and, and lots of that money should be channeled. It isn't always, but it should be channeled into scholarships. The problem then arises in, in how that scholarship money is divided out, because realistically, very, very few students that are in international schools in Hong Kong are in such a parlous economic state that they need money. I mean, people may have seen that there was a girl from um, a small village in India that's been awarded a scholarship to, to Harvard um, over the course of this admission cycle. Neither of her parents can read or write. That's a student that deserves scholarship money. Yes. Far less um, of a case here. However, what every American university website will have is a calculator. They're obliged by, um, by US federal law to have a calculator on there where the parents can enter their financial details and then the calculator will say, this is how much money we would expect you to contribute to the overall cost of your child's education. So you can get a very good idea from that. Um, there are other scholarships that are out there that can be awarded, that are awarded by organizations, foundations, things like that, that aren't specific to a university. So unfortunately there's no centralized database. Um, Fastweb.com is, is quite good um, for being able to research these scholarships. Some of them are quite large, some of them are smaller, they might be $2,000, $5,000, but you can aggregate two or three scholarships together and, and that works. For some US universities, there are kind of big name scholarships, though, and, and this applies to Canada as well. Canada has, uh, Toronto has a very good scholarship called the Lester Pearson Scholarship, named after a former Canadian premier, I think. Um, and that is a full ride scholarship for international students every year for, for quite a few. Um, if you're looking at places like kind of Harvard, Yale, there is a very realistic chance that scholarship money isn't going to be forthcoming for students who are in this kind of um, school. However, merit-based scholarships can be awarded. So those are connected to when you apply to the university, and each university will have different uh, rules about it, um, and then the potential score that you get. So it might be the case that if you do get three A stars, then you're automatically entitled to a certain scholarship, which will offer a, a discount for the three years or just for one year. There are also some scholarships that are complete free ride scholarships. They don't tend to be at, at the major names, but they'll, they'll tend to be at, at institutions that are sometimes referred to as the public ivories, so big state universities that have a very strong reputation. So there I'm thinking about scholarships like uh, 
uh, Jefferson Scholarship to the University of Virginia, which is a full ride, all accommodation, all food, all fees, um, all trips that you have to take for the university. The only thing you have to do is pay to get to Virginia and back again. So I had um, a student who's just finished with the Jefferson Scholarship, very, very wonderful student. Um, she was a bursary student at one of my previous schools, so she came from a family which wasn't wealthy at all. Um, she was awarded this scholarship and she couldn't afford the flights even, even though that was, that was a, a very small amount of money by comparison to what the scholarship was worth. Mm. And another Jefferson scholar from previous years paid for her flights because of his belief in the Jefferson Scholarship as a way of, of helping students kind of uh, move on. So there, there are scholarships out there. Uh, the Moorhead Kane Scholarship to the University of North Carolina, Carolina is another good one. Um, NYU has a campus in Abu Dhabi which has an astonishing scholarship which is all food, all fees, all accommodation, a $1,500 stipend for each student per month and all flights backwards and forwards. What university was that? Sir? So this is NYU, New York University, but the Abu Dhabi campus okay. specifically. You can spend a year at one of the other campuses. Okay. Um, the student that I worked with who got the Jefferson Scholarship also got that right. uh, and she had to choose between the two, um, which is decision. one of those hard working decisions <laughs> that some students will uh, put themselves through. Um, there are weird scholarships out there, so um, there is a scholarship to a particular university in Florida for students from a town called Nazareth in West Flanders in Belgium um, that went un, um, un awarded every single year because no students from Nazareth in West Flanders ever applied to this particular university and whenever I met people from this university they said please find us someone. So there, there, there are scholarships dotted around all over the place, it's, it's a matter of research and, and quite in-depth research, so it, it is possible, um, it means adding to your research load and, and if you're applying to America the research load will be high in terms of all the things you have to deliver. Okay, great. Well, that's all the questions from me, but we've got some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. So, a question from Jojo. Thank you, Jojo. What should we do to prepare to get into a top medical school in the UK? I, I, I'm not sure if that means as a parent, probably as a parent. Yeah. Um, so top medical schools in the UK, you are looking at quite a complex um, process. They will expect you to have some experience of working in a healthcare capacity. 10, 15 years ago, it would be enough to, to follow around a, a consultant, a gastroenterologist for two or three days and then go, oh, I understand everything about being a doctor. I think recently it, it's become clear that the focus has moved much more towards understanding the day-to-day -day experience of being a doctor. So my students that I've worked with in the past who've had most success have spent a year once a week working in a nursing home with the elderly or working with people with dementia, working with um, uh, young disabled children because you're not applying to become a consultant gastroenterologist, you're applying to become a doctor and a doctor will be dealing for the most part with people with complex long-term needs, um, particularly elderly people, so that understanding builds empathy for the student and shows a genuine commitment. You, you can't just pitch up in a um, uh, a medical school interview and then fake a year's worth of experience of, of working with old people in an old people's home. Aside from that, um, you need to be looking at something like the UCAT and the BMAT and what that entails, so those are the, the two tests that are possible for, uh, for UK universities. You need to be looking at the process of the MMI, which is the multiple mini interview that some um, UK medical schools will use, which does include um, really quite challenging situations where, where young people are asked to go into a room and, and break the news to an actor that, uh, that they've got cancer or that there's something seriously wrong with them, and the actor is told to respond in a certain way and then behind um, a one-way mirror, the, um, the assessors will look at how this 18-year-old deals with a, a grown man collapsing in agony and, and begging the doctor to, to cure them. So there are some really challenging situations and you, you have to be aware of them. There's lots of good courses. I know before I, I talked about kind of not paying a vast amount of money to go away on courses. For medicine, there are places that you can go to where actually you will get more involved in the real kind of process um, of, um, of understanding medicine. So there, there are a number of, of gap year companies that will provide kind of summer placements in, in Tanzania, in um, where else do they go to? They'll go to some places in Eastern Europe where, where there is much more hands-on medical experience. So that's a possibility, but that's a more expensive possibility. 
you've got to be reading, you've got to have a good understanding of, particularly for the UK, an understanding of how the NHS works and its pros and cons and Institute of Clinical Excellence and, and things like that and, and what the arguments are around the NHS because that's the environment you're going into. It's not enough to be really good at biology and chemistry. I've had a number of students that I've worked with who are straight A star students across maths, biology, chemistry, but because they can't dem demonstrate the empathetic skills that are so valuable in a doctor, they fall down at the, um, the interview stage. Okay, interesting. Another interesting question, thank you for this, whoever asked. Do you think, or do you often see rather, parents pushing students to apply for universities when it may not be the right thing for them to do? Yes. What do you do? Uh, so in those circumstances, I, I think the parents, I've never known a parent who's doing something to be mean to a child. They always want the best for them and they always have tremendous belief in their children and, and that's, a, that's a wonderful thing to see. So I think it's not a case that a school has to turn around and then say, parent, you are wrong, but uh, we know best. You've got a, a much more um, intimate and long-term relationship with, uh, with your children than we have. I think it's a matter of helping the parent to understand that a, a number of options is a good idea. So yes, by all means, go ahead and apply for that economics and management course at Oxford. But here are some other options that you might consider, potentially even outside the UK. Um, so if, if, if it is economics and management, and, and that's a source of great fascination for the student, but they don't necessarily want to go to the UK and they're being guided in that way because it's what the parent knows or it's where the parent studied, we might look at somewhere like Bocconi in Milan, which is a phenomenally strong university but isn't very well known because it's not a university that offers chemistry or French literature or, or history or politics. It's a university that specialises in business, economics, econometrics, um, but it's the kind of university that major international corporations will recruit from as much as they'll recruit from LSE. So I think parents need to be open to other possibilities. In, in the world of, of kind of um, US university um, and uh, US school and US oriented international school counselling, they talk about fit. The idea that there is a university or a group of universities that fit your child's personality and their desires and, and where they want to live and what they want to do with the future. And sometimes that idea of fit, what the child wants and what the parent wants, don't necessarily work towards getting the same fit. So being open to possibilities is hugely significant. Being willing to look at a, a gap year if things don't work out, or even a gap year in advance to kind of just decompress mm. from the really intense educational experience that they've been through and find out what they missed most. What, what subjects did they think, gosh, I wish I was doing some maths. I wish I was doing some English literature. Why did I let that particular thing go? Um, it is right that parents are aspirational for their children. Um, Sometimes this can manifest in a child that's very disappointed at the end because their five UK university options were too challenging, they didn't get any of them. Mm -hmm. And this year, we haven't seen it so much here, but, but colleagues in other schools have reported that um, admission rates are lower because of the overflow of last year's mm -hmm. students who were encouraged to defer um, because so many of them made their offers. So, so this year, some schools have been hit worse. And, and that's the point where we would look at the situation and then say, isn't it great that we had this plan B, so you've still got an option? Yeah, plan B is a good idea. And C, and D. And so. <laughs> as long as D isn't like kind of Duke and Dartmouth. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, another question from Sue Bin. Thank you, Sue Bin. Can you please share your opinion about students acquiring work experience related to the intended major? And would it be strategically more advantageous for a student to work for the company with uh, a good reputation? Um, for America specifically, I, I think for America, it's what you make of the experience that's the most important thing. Um, what can happen sometimes is if you, you go and do work experience with a, a big important company is that they, they will file you in a small kind of pigeonhole and so you'll learn a little bit about a, a discrete niche area but you won't learn about the company as a whole. Sometimes it's more valuable to be going into a small startup who've only got three members of staff where they may well be saying, I need someone to come with me on this particular job. Mm. You're just going to have to do it because that puts you in a, a more challenging situation. For students, some of it will depend on personality. If you are the kind of person that can go along um, to uh, HSBC and have this wonderful work experience and then go up to the person who's in charge midway through and then say, I don't feel that you're using me correctly, 
this is not working out as I'd hope, is there any chance that I could work here or work here, then that's tremendous. And, and that's a story to tell in your US application that says proactivity can stand up for themselves, self-confidence, all of that emerges very, very well. If, however, they will tell you what they'd like you to do and you aren't interested in it, and it won't give you any kind of satisfaction or, or help you, but you hide away like a mouse for a week and then write it on your, your resume, then that's no real good. I would always encourage students to look at lesser big names and more at companies where they will be genuinely needed. Great. Not just making the tea. No, not just making the tea. <laughs> All right, brilliant. So a question from Sudashina. I hope I'm saying that right. So what do you suggest for students who are keen to join a top university but are struggling to decide on a subject? Uh, go to America. America. So the, the joy of the American system is, is the fact that it gives you this range. I mean, the average American student will, will change their major three times during the course of their university experience. And sometimes that means it, it takes longer to graduate than others. But it does mean that you're, you're not held within the strictures of what you decided to do for A-levels or for IB at the age of 16. You, you have the scope to change completely from chemical engineering to gender studies. You have the scope to change from modern dance into philosophy. That, that is always there for you. If you can't decide and, and you're kind of humanities oriented, there are liberal arts courses at, a, at British universities, some very, very good ones. Um, there are those kind of combinations of joint honours courses in the UK, so history and politics, economics and French, those kinds of um, courses. There's very good liberal arts courses at Dutch universities as well that are taught in English. Um, so it needn't, if you can't decide, it needn't preclude you from going ahead with an application. If you can't decide and you are willing to, I would always advocate taking a gap year because I think the maturity that a gap year brings, the experiences that a gap year brings, always make that child more admissible than that child the year before, if okay. that makes sense. Yep. Um, I have seen, particularly for boys, boys tend to grow up a huge amount, probably because they sometimes have more growing up to do than girls, but if they go away for a gap year, I've, I've seen remarkable change that could never be achieved in a school because we, we couldn't cut them loose and abandon them in Cambodia to, to find their way around, or to one boy in particular that I work with, he, he went off to Cambodia uh, doing three months teaching, expected everything to be laid on for him like it had been at school, and he arrived and they said, fantastic, you're here, that's your classroom over there, the 30 children are waiting for you, and he just had to deal with it. Okay. But the change in him when he came back and we started looking at his university plans, just in the, the three months between when he went and, and Christmas, was remarkable. So if, if you really can't decide, then, then a gap is a great way to spend your time thinking about what you want from the future. Okay. And also, am I right in thinking that Australia, univer Australian universities are much more flexible? Yep, yep. So they're, that could be they're very option. flexible. UK universities um, will allow you to defer if you've got a place and then you could take a gap year and then you can change potentially. I mean, you would have to, to reapply. Okay. Australian universities are quite handy as well because they tend to start in January. So you yeah. could have that kind of gap year experience. Okay. Great. Right, a question from Angie. I've heard that having a portfolio be, would be one of the key factors to get an offer for studying architecture. Mm. If my child wants to do this, what kind of help can he or she get from Kellett? Uh, so in terms of building portfolios, there's a number of ways to, to go about it. Some of it will depend on the kind of architecture course you're applying to. So architectural engineering is a very different beast to architecture. Some of the, the universities will teach architecture in a slightly different way. So the, the Bartlett in, um, in UCL puts a huge amount of emphasis on, on artists rather than kind of mathematicians and physicists. So then you'd be looking for a, a genuine art portfolio as opposed to one that leans towards architecture. Um, we've got lots of experience with students going on to, to study architecture, so there's plenty of advice that can be given about the nature of the work that you're wanting to do. Um, your EPQ, which you have the option of, of doing here, could be focused on architecture and then could involve the creation of something. So, so when I went to the Ladies' College, we, we had a student whose, whose EPQ was focused around designing the wing of a plane or kind of building a scale model of a building. All of that will, will contribute really, really well. So the EPQ, just in case people don't know what that is. Uh, extended but... project qualification. It, it, it's half of an A-level, so a, a 4,000 word, I think it is. Um, a uh, piece five, of written, oh is it five? Oh, goodness. Sorry, I'm confusing it with the extended lesson. Um, that will um, be student directed in an, in an area where they want to work and they'll be supported by a mentor along that process. But, but that's a, a really good way to go about it. 
just to be interested and engaged in, in making stuff. I mean, making stuff is something that's not been affected by COVID. If you've used Lego before, if, even if you build stuff in Minecraft, there is scope there to demonstrate your understanding of how things work, how things get put together, how things are well designed. We have, we don't have any architects uh, working on it, but at the moment we're We've got a group of students who are engaged in making a Rube Goldberg machine. So if, if um, parents don't know what one of those is, it's the kind of thing that you see on um, YouTube quite frequently where a load of dominoes will knock something else and a ball will roll and it'll hit something else and something will turn around. And, uh, it's kind of a pointless machine. But we have a group of um, six students who are working on it. It will go from the top of the school to the bottom and they've constructed it in parts. It's been design process, a thought process, they've dedicated a huge amount of time to it. And it's the kind of thing that, that involves some of the skills of creative problem solving that you'll come across in architecture. Um, one of the students uh, built a trebuchet the other day in order to fire something across the atrium so that it will knock something down that will lead to something else moving. So those kinds of things that you can get involved in, we would always be really, really keen to support. Um, and obviously, a combination of subjects plays a part in this, but if you've taken either design tech or you've taken art, then there'll be great support from the excellent teachers that we have. Okay, brilliant. Okay, we've got one last question from um, Rita. We talked about this a little bit, but here we go anyway. It is better for us, sorry, is it better for a student who wants to take a gap year to apply in year 13 and defer, or should they apply during their gap year? Um, I don't have strong opinions either way. I mean, it can be really interesting to, to make an application and then, then see what comes back, and then if you're happy with it, then to defer it. Um, if you do make an application, that you have to be quite strong, I think, not to end up taking up that place if all of your friends are going away to university. So it requires a, a degree of kind of personal strength. Some universities frown on gap years a little, so I would never recommend a, a student holding an offer from Oxford or Cambridge to take a gap year because they tend to be a bit... Um, more sniffy about that. I have had a student do that. She was um, uh, training for um, a place in the Olympic equestrian team, so they were willing to, to let that slide. Um, so I quite like the freedom that it affords to not have that university application going in so that your your A-level or your IB or, or whatever qualification you're doing, you take it and there's nothing riding on that solution. I think it removes an awful lot of the stress away from students. So my own children have been told quite categorically that they're taking gap years, they're not allowed to go straight to university and they're not going to, to go through the application process um, beforehand. They may try and win me over with surly teenage attitudes uh, when we get closer to the time, but that's what I've, I've always told them since they were young. Um, I think a gap year can change your mind about things, and then that makes it quite difficult to reject a deferred offer, particularly if it's a good deferred offer, mm. if you have changed your mind. So the, the gap year is about discovering what you miss, what you've enjoyed, meeting people, getting new experiences that may well then dictate a change of direction from the one you expected. Okay, great. Good luck with winning over your children. Uh, yeah. we're, we've been going for an hour, so I think Go we're going to have to uh, leave it there. So thank you so much for joining us. If you have any more questions, or you'd like more information from Mark, um, you can send us a message via Facebook or email, and we'll get in touch. Our email address is communications at kellettschool.com. So please remember to like uh, Kellett on Facebook so you don't miss out on future episodes of Talking Heads. So thank you, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.